Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and yet another installation of the show. I am back from Costa Rica, as many of you know who are watching and listening and enjoying some of the interviews I had with the people at Rhythmia. I did go to Rhythmia, and I did do four nights of plant medicine, and I'm just keeping it real, is one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I'm definitely going back. So if you're interested in going on a trip to another country, a beautiful country at that, howler monkeys and sloths and all sorts of amazing animals we haven't seen before, and the flora and fauna and the temperature, it's just a gorgeous country, really nice people. But if you're interested in doing some deep dive into healing, let me know, just PM me and we'll get you on a list. Um, of course, everyone's gonna be vetted by Rhythmia to come back. But if you haven't heard of it, go there. And if not, rhythmia.com slash link slash Dashinger, or even easier, Rhythmia. I just don't think there's a com there. <laughs> I think it's a Rhythmia, but try it. Rhythmia slash link slash Dashinger. Either way, you'll get to see this place. It's stupendous. And, and for those of you who've been following all those interviews, it, it was all that and more. And I plan to do some aftercare, after plant medicine journey interviews as well. Uh, so I just also want to thank our sponsors to the show. We love you. We appreciate you. Dr. Dean here and Access Consciousness. If you're ready for really tremendous energy healing out in the world, and you don't want to do 90 years of work with anybody, but you want some change now, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com, as well as accessconsciousness.com. They've got classes all around the world, products, services. They are so worth checking out. I know in my life that there are times when I have to have tough conversations. Most of us like to back away from them because why would you want to piss anybody off? Why would you want to experience conflict? And I think maybe the biggest bugaboo is abandonment. That people are really afraid if I should open my mouth, open my trap, right? If I open this mouth and say what's really going on for me, I'm afraid you're going to leave me. So I've got somebody here who is an expert and is going to be able to address this because his expertise, amongst many other things, is those tough conversations. So I ask you, what is the hardest conversation you can imagine having and with whom? And furthermore, why are you even holding back from having that talk? Is it something I said? Is there something else you'd be concerned about? Some people just don't want to waste their time and energy, right? but they keep it inside and they're sitting on this volcano of feelings and emotions. And what if that tough conversation is actually the very discussion that would transform your relationship and set you free going forward? Man, sounds good to me. My guest today is David Wood. His life was spent as a consulting actuary to Fortune 100 companies on Park Avenue. And he, since then, once he left, went outside and built the world's largest coaching business, becoming number one on Google for life coaching and serving huge audiences worldwide. David coaches high-performing leaders and prison inmates. He teaches them to play full out, deepening connection, and living a regret-free life. How? By increasing their levels of truth, daring, and caring. If you'd like to find out more about him, just go to playforreal.life. David Wood, welcome to Dare to Dream. It's so great to have you. Thank you, Debbie. I'm excited to be here. And in your intro, I'm amazed you mentioned Rhythmia because I was due to go there next month for my first ever plant medicine journey. And I decided not to go. Mm -hmm. But I am booked in to go locally here in Colorado. So I'm doing three days, I think, of, <laughs> um, of plant medicine. And I'm, I'm scared and excited. Yes. Well, I think that's really normal. I think that's really good. And um, I would be so happy to talk to you further about it. But I know, I know one thing for sure. When grandmother medicine calls, it's undeniable. Yeah. And... To follow the call of the wild is so important. So good on you. And if you do go to Rhythmia, you know, and you can always come back after Colorado because I'm going next year early and I'm bringing a group. So you're welcome to be part of that group. I'd love to hear your adventures on the other end. 
Thank you. And it's, it's going to be interesting too. It's fascinating that you would say that because, because of the very work you do to see how that's going to feed in. So here you are, you've got this huge business, you're coaching leaders and prison inmates. And your conversation is really the tough conversation, CEOs, prison inmates, and how they disseminate that out into the world. I want to know how deep do you have to go to understand the importance of having a tough conversation? Well, wow. What do you mean by how deep do you have to go? I can talk about how important they are. Yeah, how deep did you have to go in your life to have a recognition, A, that your calling was to teach this and work with people on this, and B, that somewhere clearly in you inherently is, uh, I have to start doing this myself. Right. Well, I was thrown into it. It was a bit accidental. I did a personal development course, and they were really big on cleaning up the past. Mm. So I had to make lists of people that I resented, that I hated, Uh, anyone I wouldn't want to see at a reunion or uh, wouldn't want to cross on the street, anybody I felt guilty about. And then they wanted me to call these people. (laughs) I'm like, what? And, and, and like one, one on the list was a a woman, um, a girl at high school who'd broken up with me twice. She gave me the cold shoulder twice. And uh, I was kind of scarred by it. And they're like, call her, have a tough conversation and just clean it up. I said, no. And then there was a a bully from school who we used to be friends and then he just um, made fun of me and uh, I felt humiliated by him. And I felt scarred by that too. And they said, call him. I said, no. And they coached me through it and helped me find what I was so afraid of. That, which is one of the, the ways we can access a tough conversation, work out what am I worried that could happen? And I was worried that this guy from 20 years ago would think I was a total moron, mm. that he would just think I was a dickhead for calling him with this, this thing. And so my coach said, why don't you lead with that? Mm. Why don't you tell him? And so I did. I called him and I said, I can't believe I'm calling you. I'm worried you're going to think I'm a total idiot. And that changed everything. And he said, oh, well, now I'm curious. Tell me, what what have you got? How can I help? Mm. And so it was amazing. So I got thrown into this through this personal development program. And I think the last 20, 30 years, if I'm afraid of something, I tend to lean into it. I, I, my psychiatrist called me counterphobic. <laughs> and so I'm afraid of heights. So I go paragliding, for Ugh. example. And I find each time I do something that I'm scared of, I feel more expanded. Yeah. So when I go and have that conversation with someone and I don't want to have it, I start looking for, well, what am I afraid of and what might be possible out of it? And I don't always get the result that I'm looking for, but I almost always feel better about myself and I like myself more. Mm. So I realized that that's what I want for the world. I want everybody to be self-expressed. I want us all to have agency, to take responsibility and to take a risk with another human being Mm. because of all the juicy stuff that can come out of it if you're willing to play big instead of playing small. So perfect. I was literally just interviewed an hour before you and I are together on someone else's show. And what I do out in the world is visibility. That's my jam. And of course, I have a core wound around that. So that's where I'm, my DNA, my soul is supposed to perform in this lifetime. Right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so her question was about, you know, for me to help other people understand how to show up and be fully seen and heard. And it's interesting because within the pieces I was giving, and I was really wanting to share a lot of value, there's also the component of being real. The truth is I still get scared. The truth is last month when somebody found out I used to be a professional singer, but it's been 10 years, and invited me on a stage to sing, I was scared shitless. Like the voice, the little bubble said, hell no. 
But the mouse said, yeah, of course, I'd be happy to. I'm honored. Thanks for asking. And when I got on stage, I sang my ass off. And my, le my leg was doing this the whole time, patter, 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 because the body had a response. And I can't ignore the response. I have to love that piece of my leg that's going 90 miles an hour that nobody else can see, thank God, under my skirt, going, I get it. I get your energy, I get where you're at, but baby, we're here and we're gonna entertain our asses off and have a great time. And I did, and I was so happy I did it. So I understand that leaning into fear, going for the difficult things, like I think that's been a big part of my past. So with that in mind, I guess the next question I really wanna know is, how did this end up for you? Because that's big, you've got a long laundry list. Somebody says, yep, you're gonna call everyone, woof. I can imagine how big that is. So you're going down the list. What is the outcome of that once you've cleaned all that stuff up? Mm. What kind of surprises did you have? Yeah. You know, I had so many surprises. The, the toughest conversation, I believe, is, is the one we have with ourselves in the days, weeks, and months leading up to the actual conversation. Interesting. It's bigger in our head usually mm -hmm. than it's going to be for the other person. So, you know, I called this bully from school and after I'd, I'd said, I'm letting go of it and I wanted to name it and just reconnect, he said, well, what can I say or do now to help you or us move forward? I think that's a very difficult question when people say that. Well, what blew me away was that he asked it mm. because I thought he was a jerk. Mm. So that just blew me away. And then I went back to my hometown a few years later, and he was back uh, visiting his parents. And normally we wouldn't have spoken, but we did speak. We had a beer. And then when he invited some friends back to his house, he invited me to come with them, which was incredible. That hadn't happened for, for 30 years. And, and when we're sitting there having a beer at midnight out the back of his, his parents' house, he said to me, I don't think I ever would have had the courage to make the phone call that you made. And I felt respected and seen by him, which is really what I'd wanted for all, all those years. So that blew me away. When I called the, the girl who, who broke up with me twice and gave me the cold shoulder, I wasn't expecting an apology. It's important. Um, it's useful if you can have these conversations without demanding an apology. I just wanted to share my side of it and reconnect. And she gave me the most beautiful apology and said, I was young, I was stupid, and I'm really sorry. Mm. It was so healing for me mm. to hear that. That was a bonus. I didn't even need to hear that. I called a boss from my company. I've only worked for one company in my life before I went solo. And, uh, um, I'd actually threatened some legal action with my company because I didn't like how they'd um, handled it when I transferred internationally, I, I wasn't made whole. And uh, finally, I sent a letter of demand and they ended up, we had a settlement. But I thought years later, I'm like, is he holding something? Like, how are we? Mm. How are things between us? Is that weird now? Um, so I, he was on my list and I called him and I was surprised. He said, look, at the time, I'm sure, I'm sure I wasn't happy to pay that extra money, but he said, that's water under the bridge. You know, I, I, don't, I don't care. And then we got talking and he told me about his, his wife and, and issues they're having in their relationship. We'd never had a personal conversation. It was just amazing. Mm. So you mentioned be real. And, and I think you're alluding to vulnerability. Mm -hmm. T conversations are tough because there's vulnerability there. Mm -hmm. That's why we call them a tough conversation. So that's a clue. All right, I'm vulnerable, my underbelly's exposed. Mm -hmm. But if we're willing to be real and take a bit of a risk, then one of the four benefits that I list from tough conversations is deeper connection. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't get what you want, or if the person's uh, upset with you, at least you get to find out their world and they get to find out your world. And you may agree to disagree. Oh, and you, sorry, you asked me, you know, like I gave you some, some of the, the, the micro results, but I think the bigger result is I'm way more confident mm. in my life 
the t conversations that were tough 20 years ago are now easy. And the conversations that were impossible 20 years ago didn't even look like they could be conversations are now tough. Mm. I can imagine a sense of confidence that if you know, I got this, I can handle anything because I can say anything when I need to. Like all bets are off. You must be so present and so okay with whatever is because you know you have a voice and you know you have the ability, the willingness to use that voice in whatever capacity is going to serve you. Yes. And my work's not done. Because as I said, that some of the tough ones become easy, but I keep finding tougher and tougher conversations to have. Wow. Um, I coached a client on, um, he, he'd been carrying around something for 20 years. When he was a teenager, he burgled a house in his hometown. He and another kid went and stole a bunch of stuff from a friend's house. Never told anybody about it. And he's been walking around with that for 20 years. Can you imagine the guilt? Yeah. And, uh, and I coached him through a very, very tough conversation. Now, 20 years ago, something like that wouldn't even look like a conversation to me. It wouldn't even be a possibility of going to someone and confessing to a crime and risking prosecution. But I've done it since. I've gone and I've said, look, I, I did something that was illegal and I'm sorry, I want to confess and I want to make it right and I've risked prosecution. Um, so my work's not done, you know. I, I feel confident in a lot of areas and I'm still pushing myself to be vulnerable mm. when I come up against an edge. And it can be the simplest thing. It could, it could be my personal assistant. And I don't want to say to her, could you finish by six o'clock? And, and just be done because I like some alone time at night and thanks for working hard, but can you go? Like it's, <laughs> I still find edges to be vulnerable and to have that tough conversation with people. Oh my God, so good. So CEO, lay person, prison inmate, is there any difference when it comes to how you coach people to have that tough conversation? That's a great question. I don't think there's a difference in the coaching. There's a difference in the language. So, for example, in prison, um, you know, if someone's going to call someone out or, or threaten them or um, invite a fight, they might say something like, hey, bitch, that's a challenge. Now, in a boardroom, you may not hear that language. You might hear different language, I something so. that's <laughs> right. But it's the same concept. Someone calling you out someone telling you they don't like how you're doing something, someone um, might be really upset with you or you're upset with someone else. You want to change someone's behavior. Um, in prison, they, they get to call their family mm -hmm. and uh, they can be some really tough conversations because sometimes their family is really upset with them and their family doesn't get to see them very often and their kids growing up without a father or a mother, like all these Really? And plus they might've done a hor horrible things to their family. Um, many of them are going through addiction. Mm. So there are so many things they need to clean up, but a CEO also has things to apologize for. A CEO also has to say to someone, can you do something differently? This is not working for me. So I'm finding that human is human and, and, all of us face vulnerability, which is what makes it a tough conversation. And all of us face a risk of loss. You, you mentioned this in the intro about, you know, who would want to feel awkward or who would want to risk abandonment. Mm -hmm. You could risk, you know, when you have a tough conversation, you could be risking, let's say you confess to your partner that you cheated, which I did at the age of 18. I cheated on my first partner. I went and confessed. She broke up with me. I managed to salvage that. That was a very tough conversation. Mm -hmm. And it was so horrible. I've actually never cheated <laughs> in the last 33 years since then. Wow. But you could risk someone leaving you. You could risk being fired. You could risk being excluded from a group. Someone might just give you the cold shoulder for, for a couple of days because they're upset. So there's a lot of things to risk. What we need to, 
work out and, and we'll give listeners a, a free download where you can do a worksheet and go through the four steps of tough conversations. But what I have people do is work out what's the potential gain. You want to write down what's my hope or intention from this conversation. Let's, let's take the confessing about cheating, right? Or let's, let's say you, you, you got drunk one night and made out with somebody at a party. Okay. And you decided, I'm just not going to tell my partner that. And maybe it's been a couple of years and you just, I'm just not going to tell. Well, what's your hope or intention? It might be that um, you can be closer. You can stop keeping this in between you and your partner and be more intimate. Or uh, you can check for impact and find out if there's a renegotiation, renegotiation of the agreement that's needed. But come up with what your hope is. If you have no hope or intention, then maybe don't have that conversation. We're not going to do it just, just to be, to be um, masochistic. So what's the gain? And then work out what am I risking? And it could be that my partner breaks up with me or they'll be upset or whatever it is. And then decide, am I willing to risk that? And if you're not willing to risk it, I mean, I was, when I called the college that I used to go to when I was a kid, when I was, you know, 18 and I called and I said, I'm sorry, I stole the college sign 15 years ago. And they're like, who is this? I said, my name's David Wood and I attended college. And they said, when? I was like 15, 20 years ago. They're like, why are you calling now? I explained, I'm a, I'm a life coach and I try and live with integrity. And it seemed like fun at the time, but now it seems like vandalism and I stole it. In fact, I stole it twice. Mm. I stole two signs. Um, I was risking prosecution. I was risking being in the newspaper and my reputation being tarnished. And I decided I was willing to risk that for my hope. And my hope was that I would feel more of a sense of integrity and I would feel like myself more. So if there's profit, if the gain outweighs the risk, then maybe you'll go and roll the dice and have that conversation. And if it doesn't, Hey, there are some conversations I don't have. Yeah. yeah. I would think at the very least, I mean, in my estimation, listening to what you're saying, it would seem the risks could be like a laundry list. It could be pretty intense. And as far as the gains, I'm sure there's some uh, very specifics with certain situations and people. I also sense there could be this blanket gain, obviously, to free oneself of the bags of crap you've been carrying around. Yes. All of that is this horrible energy that we hold against ourselves and bring forward. So there's that element. And then also the element of once it is free, once it's said, once it's out there and done, the relief, the ability to be fully present must be magnificent. Oh, look, I, I was just going to say, I can't tell you. And I literally can't tell you. Um, the exact details, because it's not just my story, but it's someone else's story. But the broad brush strokes are, I, I did something that was wrong when I was younger and, and it was illegal. And I did go back and confess and, and I could have gone to jail. Mm -hmm. I really could have. And I, and I decided I needed to apologize. Mm -hmm. And um, it was terrifying for me to make that confession, not knowing what they would do. But the relief, I had carried that for 20 years. It was my biggest, darkest secret. I've shared it with friends where I thought it would make a difference and help. And I shared it with my wife before we got married so that there was no, I don't like any skeletons mm. to be in my closet. I don't want anything that's ever going to bite me on the ass. If it's going to bite me on the ass, let's have it happen now. I don't want to, you know, have that hanging over me. Um, so the risk can be enormous, but the relief I tell you what, I can't put a price on, on how settled I am in myself now. I don't have to hide anything from anybody. And you, you got me thinking about something before you talked about the gain and the laundry list of risks. Here's the problem. And I haven't said this on any interview before, but I just realized the mind will present all the risks and blow them up out of proportion even. Mm. So that's what we're seeing. And that's why we don't have the conversations. The mind is not presenting to us the gain. 
the hope or the intention. The mind is not presenting that. So Mm -hmm. I'm out here beating the drum to push the benefits of self-expression, of feeling good about ourselves, of um, self-love and vulnerability and deep connection. I want to raise those as possibilities so that people, my hope is they'll hear that and go, yeah, all right. That is a scary, tough conversation. And I'm going to have that one. I may not, may not have the big one, the big kahuna. I'll file that away until I'm ready, but I might go and have that conversation with my partner, with mm. my kid. I might confess something mm. with my, with my boss, my coworker. I might ask for a pay, for a pay raise. I'm going to actually do it because I'll feel better about myself regardless of what happens as a result. Totally. You know, you remind me when I was younger, I'm I'm going to purposely omit the place I worked, but I worked for a really well-known going into space government agency. (laughs) And I had to make a confession. So one of the, of F it, you know, one of the rocket scientists came to me and said, I have this really weird phone bill. Like there's all these charges. And he, I could tell he was mystified about how to address that. And he walked away and I thought, if the earth could swallow me, it would be now please. Because I had been using his phone to make those calls. And I, oh my God, you know, the days I spent in mortification and regret and there was no justification. I just felt horrible about myself. I'll go that way, way before I'll defend myself. But I knew I had to do this. And so I knocked on this guy's door and and asked if I could speak to him. I went into his office I, I really thought I was going to start crying like uncontrollably because I was so embarrassed to have to say this, but I knew it was the only way out was through. And I just said, I have to confess to you that those calls were me, um, that I didn't want them to show on my phone. So I was using them on your phone. I just told the truth, the entire truth and nothing but the truth. And I probably did cry. I was young, you know, but I was so ashamed and I was... And he was such a nice human being that made me feel even worse. This man, I didn't expect it, zero expectations, because the same thing, government agency, let me tell you, you don't play there. They will, they, they will do things, I've seen things, and they, they don't have a lot of compassion. So I was expecting whatever, I was open. But instead, he closed the door, and he sat with me, and he listened to me, and he talked to me. And when I was all done, he said, this will never leave the room. And I forgive you. And I you know, picked up the remnants of myself and we're all done. I think he gave me a hug and I walked out of the room and I was just like, how did I get so lucky? Oh my God. And I was, you know, it, it was a process, by the way. I didn't just suddenly go, woohoo, relief. I mean, it really energetically took time for all of that to catch up with me, the grace. And, um, and just like you said, like, never again best lesson, most expensive lesson ever to confess. Like I was never going to behave like that and go behind someone's back. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds super healing. And, and it has me think too, hearing that, that I want, I want our listeners to use some discernment because Mm -hmm. I used to be thinking, you know, you should, you should have every tough conversation. You should make every confession. You know, it's always worth it. You watch movies and when someone does that and they risk all for the truth, it's inspiring. But, you know, in my older age, um, I realized there are limits. Like, for example, I was willing to risk prison to confess. Mm. So I made that decision. If you're not willing to risk prison to confess, then don't have that conversation. Don't do that confession. Um, I I try like nine, nine out of 10 times at least I find in my life it's worth it. Mm -hmm. But hey, when Balinese immigration comes to my door and says, we think you might have been subletting a villa illegally and we need to talk to you about it and there could be some jail time involved and there could be some bribes 
um, that you'll be negotiating from within prison, hey, maybe that's not the best time for a confession. <laughs> that's what I worked out. I'm not kidding you. Two years ago in Bali, I had this and I like to tell the truth and I like to have those tough conversations. That was a conversation I didn't want to have. And so I left the country the same day. Wow. I had a life there. I had a pet. I had furniture. I had friends. I had eight months paid on my villa. A lawyer told me I would leave the country, come back in a few months, everything will be fine. So I've realized there are some conversations that um, you may choose not to have, but we're erring on the side of sweeping too many of them under the carpet. Yeah. I don't want to scare people too much because, because I think we're going to do better by having way more and risking more. Yes. This is huge because I think most people walk around and go, I tell the truth. I'm honest. Yeah. I know that's, I think that's what we think. And I not. think that too. I think that too, right? I teach this stuff, but there are always areas of the mind that, that are hidden and there are always, it's just subtle and you got to catch it and go, Oh, I don't, I feel off about that person or I didn't like how they spoke to me at that party last week. Right. We just sweep it under the carpet and go subconscious. I've been working for 20, 30 years to try and make those things conscious. So I can realize, Oh, I got an issue with that person. Here's one way you can find out you'll be complaining about them to somebody else. That's your clue. That's good. You say something to someone else that you haven't said to the person involved. I catch myself saying it. I'm like, oh, I'm gossiping here. I'm complaining and I'm going to have to tell them about it. Ooh, I love that because that is so clear. Um, yep. Good one. Yeah. I'm going to take a quick break here. My mind is going like, wow, I have so much to ask you. So, Folks, this is Dare to Dream. Clearly, I feature very successful, brilliant leaders in their expertise. They've created major goals. Wouldn't you like to be one of those? What would you do if you knew that you could not fail? What would you do if you knew that you would be free and bold and completely successful? These are the conversations we have here to help move you forward. If you would like to be part of the Dare to Dream podcast team, I am right now warmly inviting you to join us. Please go to patreon.com slash dare to dream. When you join and donate to the show for a dollar, cup of coffee or more, you will get gifts from me to thank you and help keep this show going really as strong as it is and has. And I can continue to bring on the brilliant minds that I do. Again, this show is about you. It's the number one transformation so you can create the best ways to live your inner and outer life. Go to patreon.com slash dare to dream and I thank you in advance. And if you're tuning in after we've started, I'm interviewing David Wood, a former consulting actuary to Fortune 100 companies. He left his Park Avenue job to become a number one Google life coach. He shows us how to have the tough conversations we really want to avoid. And he shows that these are actually the conversations that are the doorways to confidence, success, and love. If you would like to learn more about him, go to playforreal.life. David, I just want to say, I never heard that word consulting actuary, so I had to look it up. I th you said I, it really well. A lot of people mess that up. They got no idea what it is. And I'm like, oh, she nailed that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm a nerd. I love to research. I love the etymology of words. So I was fascinated. And it turns out, folks, if you don't know as well, that an actuary is a business professional who deals with the measurement and management of risk and uncertainty. I don't know about you, but that's kind of sexy. Right. And I think like <laughs> these are huge words that people run away from risk and uncertainty and definitely like tough conversations comes under that. How, why was that even compelling to you to go into a career around risk and uncertainty? Right. I love where you're going with this. Um, I was really good at mathematics. Uh, when I hit 
uh, year nine, I guess I was like 15 or something, something happened and I started doing really well in school and particularly maths. And I figured, well, I guess I'll be an accountant because that's, <laughs> that's what you do. And then um, my mother's a teacher and she found out about a profession that was not very well known, but was much harder to qualify in. And uh, there was more money, more prestige, and uh, it seemed more complex than just numbers. So it was an actuary. And then we found out that they were offering scholarships. So in the US, I know people get student loans of like over $100,000. Well, in Australia at the time, college was free and I got paid oh. to go to college. And they hoped that at the end of three years, I would uh, return the favor by uh, taking a job with them. So I had the incredible privilege of, of actually having money while I'm in college. And uh, yeah, it is about risk. And I'm noticing that now affecting my coaching and my speaking and my podcasting, because I think in terms of risk, I'm always like, I'm a paraglider pilot. I'll jump off the cliff, but I wear the helmet. I'm always assessing. So in these tough conversations, I guess I'm being a classic actuary and saying, what's the potential gain? What's the potential risk? weigh it up and then go and roll the dice if it, if it looks like a good bet. That's how I think I'm a geek. That's sort of interesting though, because when you describe it, it sounds like you're present, but at the same time you're seeing the matrix of yes. everything. And that's a lot of discernment too about go here, don't go there. This might be good. Watch out for that. It's very interesting. Yeah. You know, you've got to make good bets in life. If you, um, if you offer me, uh, let's say we flip a coin and if it's heads, you're going to pay me $2. And if it's tails, I got to pay you a dollar 50, right? I'm going to take that bet all day, every day, right? You've got to play the odds. Um, same in business. If there's, if it's a risk and you could lose something, but you can absorb the loss, but the gain is higher, take that bet, go for it, play the odds. It's the same in poker. And I think it's the same with the conversations as well. Mm -hmm. You've got to see the gain and then take that risk. And maybe you blow a few, you know, you might have a couple of train wrecks and someone gets upset with you and you've got to go and do round two or round three. Maybe your partner breaks up with you. Maybe that's what should happen because of what you did. And maybe they're just exercising their agency and their choice. Mm. But over time, you keep playing the odds, you get great stuff come from it. I think we're too risk averse mm. when it comes to vulnerability. And we're too, uh, I don't know what the opposite is, but we take on too much risk about stupid things like smoking or eating sugar or not wearing a seatbelt or going to Bali and renting a scooter and not having insurance. We do stupid things as human beings. We take on too much risk. But when it comes to the heart and being vulnerable and being expressed, oh, no, I, I better not get up on stage and speak about that. Or I don't want to ask that person to buy my product because they might say no. Or I'm not going to ask that woman out because she might reject me and everyone's going to see me at the bar. T I've never spoken about this except inside my head, so I'm glad it's coming out. We're too risk averse when it comes to matters of vulnerability. 100%. I love in the beginning how you called it this underbelly. You know, last night, it just so happens after a wine event, um, I came back here with my boyfriend and we'd had a little bit of tension between us. Um, God, and it's always so bad when he listens to my shows back. So I love you. <laughs> Let me just preface with I love you. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's just a story to illustrate the underbelly. I think honestly, it's because I did uh, plant medicine. I'm not kidding. It was so profound for me. And we came back and I've, we both had little be niggling behaviors for each other. Um, and it's not over clearly, you know, I'm with him because the over arc of our relationship is, you know, magnificent and wonderful and I'm super thrilled, but there are those undercurrents and, and I actually got even clearer in our conversation last night. Bless him. He's the one who opened it up. That means a lot to me that he's the one who opened up the conversation. And I went places that surprised me in talking to him and saying, 
you know why I do that? Here's the truth beneath that behavior. I know I'm coming off like a dick, but tell you the truth, it actually has nothing to do with that. Here's the truth. I look at you and I think of you in the long term. And if I'm with you forevermore, amen, there's a part of me protecting me. And I need to know that if we're together, these things are not going to come back and bite me. That, you know, these behaviors you have, um, they're really being worked out. So I get worried for myself. I'm protective of myself. And then I start looking like I'm being critical or I'm judging you or I'm not, you know, I'm being too much of a nudge. But here's the truth beneath. Let's end all of that because it doesn't serve either of us. The truth is I'm worried and I'm trying to take care of myself. And I, instead, I'm acting out through those behaviors. And we did it several times and I kept pulling back the curtain. I got to say just that alone, the relief was huge because I thought, wow, I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have mm. to behave like that with him and turn him off and feel, frankly, I feel out of control when I do it because I'm not telling the truth. And so it gave me a lot of hope going forward and more of a position of being in choice. And also I feel like it offered him choice to say, wow, and I'm going to just speak my truth. I'm with this magnificent woman. She's amazing. Like, look what's possible. And if I really want this, I probably want to look at these pieces because they'll help make her feel safe and us connected and have a great life. So there's lots of wow. possibility. Well, what I love about, about your experience there is that when you started, it sounds like when you started the conversation, you guys didn't know where it was going to end up. At all. Now, this is, a, this is a key piece of tough conversations. And one of the reasons they're tough, we can't control them. Mm. Now, I'm a control freak, yeah. self-confessed control freak. And I like to work it all out in my head and then go and present it in a way that's going to get me what I want. I'm trying to work it all out one-sided. But one of the ways we can ease up on that and make it easier for ourselves is to say, I'm going to start with my side, but I'm going to be curious. Hmm. I'm going to learn and I'm going to find out what they think. And that's actually step four of the, the four-step blueprint that we'll give people is what's your world? How is it for you to hear this? And what are you thinking? Do you have a better idea than what I've got? And together you go somewhere you couldn't have planned. Follow the yellow brick road. So why don't you give us the blueprint? Cause I know, I hope people are going to be going there because you could change our planet by doing this behavior uh, out into the world and cleaning up your life. What is the blueprint? I'm ready. Right. You mean the URL or the four Let's steps? Let's do the URL and start there and then go to the four steps. Yeah. You guys can go to playforreal.life and download it there for free. Okay. Uh, play for real. We spell it out. F-O-R. Playforreal.life. And uh, you'll get the blueprint plus the worksheet. The mm. worksheet will ask you some questions to prepare you. Oof. So if you're really terrified of the conversation now or thinking I couldn't have it or I've got no idea, don't worry. Worksheet will guide you through it. And then the blueprint will tell you the four steps. And you can even have those four steps written down in front of you and say, I wanted to take some notes because I'm worried I'm going to screw this up. Mm. And I'd like to um, make sure I, I do my best job at this. You can be honest. You don't have to like pretend you're a ninja at this. <laughs> What are the four steps? Four steps. Number one, you ask permission for the conversation. We don't just, just don't go in there and, and say, hey, honey, I cheated on you. Or, um, hey, you smell and you need to take a shower. You ask permission. And this is a good place to share your hope that you created in the worksheet. Mm. Uh, the permission might be something like, hey, do you have five or 10 minutes for a potentially awkward conversation yet possibly a very fruitful conversation. Oh, I like that. Yeah. You let them know this is a bit edgy, but it could be rewarding. And this is a good place to share the hope. My hope is that we're going to uh, work together better as a team or that, that we'll, I'll feel closer to you. Um, Cause that's something someone can say yes to They're like, mm -hmm. Oh, this is why I would want to listen to something awkward. Okay. Go. 
And then step two, and this is optional, uh, you might do what I did with the bully and share your fear mm. or your concern. My concern is that you might get really angry with me. My concern is that you might, if I'm honest, that, that you might break up with me over this and I don't want to lose you. So this is a very vulnerable step, but it can get you very connected and let them know that you're uh, on your edge here. And then step three, share whatever the issue is. And this is a good spot to bring in your request from the worksheet. On the worksheet, I'll ask you, what's a request you could make? Hmm. Is this something you can ask for instead of just complaining about a certain behavior? For example, if you've got a coworker who smells, the request might be that you have a shower. Or the request might be that you... Um, pick up your socks or your, whatever it is, but you actually ask for something instead of just, just complaining. And then step four could be the most important. You get curious. This is where you listen and negotiate. Find out about their world. What's it like to hear that? How does it land for you to hear that? And uh, what, what's your thinking? What are your ideas? Do you have something better than, than what I'm thinking? They might, they might have a, something that's even better than what you thought of. And so you listen and negotiate. Those are the four steps. That is beautiful. So I have a tough situation to ask you about how to use those four steps. Great. Got the best coach here. My mother has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And... Without a doubt, you know, things going away, her, her physical decline is immense. Um, although I will say at some level, I feel she's quite lucid. I'm the only one here on the West Coast, Los Angeles. So, you know, I'm the one, I'm the go-to person. And so I'm going to keep this very real. You know, before my grandmother and grandfather passed away, I, I was madly in love with them, very close to them. I just had some intuition as a kid. I was complete. Like I had said everything to them. So we were on the same page. They knew how much I loved them and exactly how I felt. I took the time. But I feel very strongly about having no regrets when somebody dies. Mm. And I really want to do this same. with my mom. And I did not have an easy time with her growing up at all. And although now with her Alzheimer's, frankly, it's also softening her, which is awesome for me. I feel compelled to have a tough conversation with her. And that means the everything. You know, everything from my acknowledging how lucky I am to have someone who is brilliant and liberal and um, open and uh, did yoga when nobody did and, you know, accepted all sorts of races and genders when nobody else did. Um, super social and a smart, my God, she's so smart as a whip. Um, very musical and talented and cultured, quite cultured. Those are my thank you so much for all of that. The other stuff and my my fears are that it's going to go south, that um, she has a penchant for saying things that are really untoward and really unkind and unfiltered and strange. And I don't even believe are steeped in a reality that I was in. Um, so it's really concerning for me to open that and have that and not know what's going to come back at me. Yeah. Firstly, I moved by this topic. I think it's beautiful that you want to feel complete and nothing held back with your mother and particularly to have no regrets um, for the time when she dies. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is that I think it's natural for you to have hesitation because it doesn't sound like there is yet a space for you to share some of these sensitive things mm -hmm. because might might be very sensitive for her she might get very defensive. I know it's been hard for my mother to hear about some of the things that have had a big impact on my life. Um, she's still dealing with hearing some of that because she beats herself up. Mm. So you don't yet have a space. You don't yet have the permission mm. to share it, but you can create that. So 
you want to do a, a quick role play, like a minute? Sure. All right. I'm, it's going to be easy for you because I'm going to be you. Oh, yeah. And, you, okay. and you'll be your mother. This is, and this is not in the fourth step blueprint. I'm pulling on some ninja stuff here. So, mom, I've realized that I don't want to have anything between us withheld. I want to be fully expressed with you. And I realize I want to share, like, there are some great things about our relationship that I haven't really told you all about. And I want to tell you all about that. And there are some things that I've held on to where I felt disappointed or sometimes I felt hurt. And I haven't said those things because I don't know how you'd react. And I'm wondering if you might give me the space to really talk for, for maybe 10 minutes and just share things. And I know it may not be easy at times, but my hope is that this will bring us even closer mm. and even more more loving and i wonder if you'd be open for that even though it might be it might be difficult okay sure i can do anything for 10 minutes okay great so then if that doesn't happen if she does jump in then you might want to do a little coaching say i'm sure there'd be a lot to say and this must be so hard to hear and i wonder if if i could just have another five minutes and then I want to listen to everything you've got to say. Oof, okay. Because not everyone's good at listening. It can be hard mm -hmm. to listen. So it's up to you to request and create that space. So how was it for you to hear that as your mother? Yeah. So I didn't want to fully go into her because I actually can. <laughs> I, yeah, I energetically have the ability to do that. So I wanted to just protect myself a little bit, but I allowed some of that to open. And it was interesting because I was negotiating the whole time. So I was listening to you, but inside of myself going, huh, huh, no, yes. Mm. And you used really capital words that kept adjusting me in my, my inner negotiations because you use things like bring us closer together and have a better relationship. And then I'm like, oh, okay, I'm on board for that. So those things were very helpful. I was still hearing the other things and I think bracing myself. And ultimately, yeah. when you gave a time, that was everything because otherwise it could have been ad infinitum. But as soon as you said for 10 minutes, I was like, oh, I could do anything for 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is why step one is so important because if you just went in and started sharing with a parent about the things you're disappointed in, they're not prepped for that. Mm -hmm. And our identity wants to fight back and defend ourselves. But if you can prep them and, and show them away, like, I'd like to be able to share this because I think it'll have us closer and I understand it might be difficult and it'll be hard. It'll be hard for me when it's your turn mm. because you might share some things that you're disappointed in or some, th you know, I'd like to know anywhere I've upset you. Um, I want to hear it all. Mm. And I, I, I'm bracing myself for that. So it's awkward, but here's the profit in it that we'll be closer together. Does mm. that help? Hugely. Wow. Yeah. I, feel, I, I really get, as you're saying this, the setup is everything. You're con creating this container for both of you to do this tough conversation. And I like the boundaries. So everybody, you know, I'm not here to beat you up. I'm not here to right. beat you up. I really am here to move this forward. So there's so much peace between us. I mean, this is big. You know, I'm really offering myself. I get saying this to you right now. I'm offering myself a huge gift of freedom in this lifetime to like all the other work I've done in the past. This feels like it could be the final cord to finally yeah. do this with her. So I'm curious wow. if you don't mind to tell me about you. Um, so just for an example, I know that you're in TLC, right? You're in the transformational leadership. Well, just, before you, just before we go there, I have yeah. a ninja tip for you. I have ninja a black belt tip. tip. Please. With your mother, with your mother, I would run through all of this with somebody else first. I would talk it out mm -hmm. and, and say, and have them even be in the place of your mother and say, I'm upset that you did this and I'm upset that you did that and I feel hurt by this, you can release a lot of charge with somebody else. She doesn't need all that charge. And if you can 
see if you can find compassion for all of those things and realize that she was doing the best she could the whole time. And like, see if you can do all that work first, it's going to be a lot softer when you share it with her. It'll be a lot easier for her to hear it. Brilliant. Um, yeah. This is why I have my clients. We role play the conversation first. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons we role play it first, get out a lot of the charge and see a way that can really work. Then they go out into the world and they have it. You had a question about TLC. Thank you. I'm so in what you're saying. Thank you. That, that's a huge piece. I will do this. And I can really feel how that will be so much easier for me as well. And oh, yeah. I won't have to go in with all that energy. Yeah, I was just curious because like a little testy. So if you're in TLC, you're in Transformational Leadership Council, you know, so for people who don't know, this is a, a thought leader mastermind council, like half of my friends are in it, people like Jack Canfield, people like Marianne Williamson. What if, just to like create a situation, what if something happened in the proceedings there? David, and you were like, I'm not happy with this. That doesn't work for me. And you knew, this is a tough conversation, man. Look at who these people are, right? How would you handle that? I know this is like a really big, broad question, but just I'd love to have a sense of the machinations for you behind the scenes. If you had to show up for something that felt kind of big for you with colleagues you respected and a situation you wanted to be a part of, but maybe it wasn't working, et cetera, what would you do? Would you talk to them? And if so, how would you get yourself prepared? <laughs> well, I... I'd, I'd probably go on instinct because I've been doing tough conversations for so long. So I'd probably go on instinct, but I tell you what, I've gone on instinct even recently and then just gotten lost. And I've realized if I just filled in my own worksheet, it would have gone better. Hmm. For example, one question on the worksheet is put yourself in their shoes. Let's say with your mother, hmm. put yourself in her shoes what might it be like for her to hear about what you're disappointed in or upset in, you know, try and have some compassion. If I'd done that, my conversation would have gone easier. I would have seen their world and been able to preempt that. So I, I would hope if it's chargy enough that I would fill in my own worksheet mm. and then um, ask permission for the conversation and share a hope. I've had some difficult conversations at TLC um, it's difficult for me to share this on air, but one conversation was when I, when I was nominated and got into TLC, I found out that uh, it was a mistake. There was, there, it was along the line, there was some mistaken identity and I started feeling like I shouldn't be there and I was there under false pretenses. And that was a horrible, f I'm in Hawaii with all these people and I already had imposter syndrome already. Half, half of us do there. In fact, maybe three quarters of us have imposter syndrome hanging out with all these people. And um, I wanted to quit. I was going to resign. So that was, that was really awkward. Now, I'd like to say that I had the courage to go and address a, a tough conversation head on. I just shared with a friend there how I felt and that I felt like resigning and fortunately, she mentioned it to the right person and the right person called, called me and made it easy for me and said, you so belong here. Oh. And I really hope that you're not going to, to leave. Um, so they made it, made, it, made it easy for me. But I've had some tough conversations there and I hope I would bust out my worksheet. Uh, particularly, the more important it is, the more value I think there is in prepping for it just so that your chances of it going well like with your mother um you you've got the link now you can download the worksheet and um your chances of it going better are just better yeah i think i'm sharing your worksheet with a few people too really like this is this is such a powerful conversation i feel very grateful uh for whatever your life path has been that it's led you here because this is a tremendous gift to all of us. It is not talked about, and it is one of those things that if we learned to work the blueprint and do the work out into the world, I mean, really, we're talking world peace. 
It changed no the world. Reason. Right. It's yep. a total game changer. So yep. thank you for your brilliance. My pleasure. And I'm so glad to meet you. I find I really like you. And this is one of my favorite interviews. Thank you. I'm honored, really honored. Let's do it again. And I end today's show with this quote from Shonda Rhimes. Because no matter how hard a conversation is, I know that on the other side of that difficult conversation lies peace, knowledge. An answer is delivered. Character is revealed. Truces are formed. Misunderstandings resolved. Be sure to tune into next week's interview on Dare to Dream with my next guest, who's Patrick Dominguez. He spent a decade building a multi-million dollar coaching business with Bill Barron, and he's personally coached and trained thousands. But here's the cool thing. Patrick is going to share a new process that he took me through called Inner freedom. Wow. Also listen to all the archives of Dare to Dream. I highly recommend Dr. John D. Martini, as well as the, I hope it's okay. I call him adorable, but he is adorable. Ken Honda, who's the, oh, Japans. he's so great. I love Ken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And he did a great show with me. He wrote the New York Times bestselling book, Happy Money. All my guests are all that, all that and more. So enjoy this show live and the replays. Subscribe to Dare to Dream, your number one transformation conversation. And please leave a five-star review so other people can find this show. And if you're listening to the audio and you want to watch my guests and see how gorgeous and amazing they are and animated and how we interact, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. And remember, the secret to success is always to have the courage in the first place. Thanks for joining us today.